Can you beat the Final Fantasy XII Zodiac Challenge? In this challenge run series, each character's job will be determined by their actual zodiac sign. And if you want to know more about each of the character's zodiac signs, then I highly recommend you check out this video I made, which tells you all about each character. So I'll give you guys a few seconds to check out that video before continuing with this. Okay, that's enough time. Let's get into some rules real quick. Rule number one, only one job per character. We are not using dual classes. The characters in this game have one zodiac sign and one zodiac sign only. So once their job has been assigned to them, they cannot deviate into any other class. Rule number two, no quickenings or summons allowed in battle. We are allowed to license summons on the license board to gain access to special equipment and stat boosts, but we are not allowed to use them in battle because they are very overpowered and we want to make sure this is as difficult as possible. Rule number three, we have to be every single hunt in this game to complete it, excluding the final hunt which takes about 12 hours to complete. We're not going to bother with that, but every other hunt aside from the last must be completed to beat this challenge. And finally, rule number four, don't forget to live, laugh, and love. Hi, gay! So if you are new to the channel and don't know how these challenge run videos work, basically I will show you some gameplay footage and some strategy mixed in with my thoughts and opinions on the story with a few memes and gags in the middle to keep it entertaining. So without further ado, let's get into the challenge, shall we? Before we get into some gameplay, I'm going to address the big story elephant in the room. It's the thing everybody mentions whenever speaking about Final Fantasy XII and its story, and that is the similarities to the Star Wars franchise. And do you want to know my opinions on it? I freaking love it. I used to love Star Wars as a kid, and this game just feels like a Japanese interpretation of some Western media. And I'm all about it, you know? It's very cool to have a Final Fantasy version of Star Wars with cute anime boys and magical spells. I feel like people tend to say this game lacks originality because of it and I don't think there's anything wrong with taking inspiration from other stories. I feel like most westerners can make the connections very easily because we are surrounded by Star Wars constantly but for people in Japan it is less of a big deal so having a sort of Japanese interpretation of a beloved story in the west is pretty magical to me. I think that's what's awesome about media is that we can take inspiration from other pieces of media and adapt them into our own unique stories. I don't think it diminishes the originality of the game. I still think it's an original game with its own merits and quirks and things like that. But yes, these Star Wars references are very apparent and I will only mention a few of them every now and then. So it's not completely full of Star Wars references and I don't want to reiterate what has already been said. But that being said, I will still mention it from time to time where I see fit. Does that make any sense? No. So this opening cutscene is just laying the groundwork for the game. Essentially, there is a war going on between the Empire of Arcadia and Dalmascar, which is where our heroes are from. And yes, we have a princess, we have a prince, we have war, we have tragedy. This game is a very big game. It's not just about a small group of people, it is about entire nations and the prevention of war and chaos and destruction. But we will learn more about the story as the game goes on. So let's skip ahead to some gameplay now. And our journey begins with our main protagonist, Twink. Rex, sir. And I believe Rex is a Pisces, which means he will be in the class of... Okay, he's dead. Uh, Captain, I... Ah, see, the game was actually bluffing us. And the main character is none other than Rex's brother. Bond. Who is an orphan from Rabanasta, who spends his time murdering rats in the sewers. I guess veganism has not yet hit Damascus like it has our world. This is an acceptable hobby, apparently. And here we are introduced to what is basically the main hub world of Final Fantasy XII, which is the city of Rabanasta. And I love this city. It feels bustling, it feels complete, it feels big. And this game takes a lot of inspiration from Middle Eastern cultures. Even the name Dalmasca sounds eerily similar to Dalmascus in Syria. And it's a very cool vibe, which is very different to every other Final Fantasy game. And as you can see here, the people of Rabinastar are upset with the Empire's existence in their city. And people like Van feel the need to take what they believe is rightfully theirs. 
And it's very cool. I feel like people have a lot of issue with Vaan as a protagonist in this game, but I really like him. As he shows you how a regular person is affected by war, Vaan kind of acts as a mirror to the audience, someone that they can relate to, as the rest of the characters in this game are princesses and knights that are far beyond anything we could ever be. So for that reason, I kind of like Vaan. What? And here we are also introduced to Vaughn's friend Pinello, who kind of sucks. She's always telling him what to do. She's always saying to stay out of trouble and making sure he doesn't do anything bad. And it's like, just let him be a bit of a bad boy. What is wrong with Vaughn stealing from the empire? And I know it's just because she cares or whatever, but it just becomes very tiring to hear her constantly say, Vaughn, don't do this, don't do that. But I just find her kind of infuriating. Maybe it's her stupid hair. Cause you're not that cute. And your hair is uneven, you look dusty. Or just her design in general, I find it very uninspired and just a bit weird. I can't put my finger on it, I should like her, she's cool and spunky and fun. I just don't, maybe I'm just a I don't know. But I can't help the way I feel, maybe my love for her will grow throughout this series, who knows. I know that. You think I like living like this? One of these days, I'll fly an airship of my own. I'll be a sky pirate, free to go where I will. Vaughn has big dreams of becoming a sky pirate because he's an Ares like that, but you gotta start somewhere. So we start off by killing this tomato, who just so happens to be the cutest little tomato I've ever seen in my entire life. And it hurts to kill him, but we have to make Vaughn's dreams come true. And to do that, we have to slaughter vegetables. We started with the meat, now we're on to veg. What else is left for Chef Vaughn to cook up? Oh yeah, and we also assign Vaughn the White Mage class because he is an Ares, as previously mentioned. Ugh, this will make a nice souvenir. Oh. That does it! After this emotional scene, we get the first ever FMV of the game, and usually the FMVs in Final Fantasy games are like the best part. They're super high quality, crazy cinematic masterpieces. But something about the ones in Final Fantasy XII just feel very empty. Like the sound design is just so terrible. Where is the sound of the engine? Where is the sound of the crowd and the people and the city? It's all just very quiet. And I don't know why, but it just leaves the epic moments in this game to feel very hollow. And nothing ever really seems to just like pop, you know? The game just feels way too subtle compared to other Final Fantasy games. And that's probably my biggest critique of the game is that there is nothing that really makes it stand out. Is Imperial Highness Lord Vane Solidor Oh yeah, and it's here that we get introduced to the main antagonist of the game, Vane, and I don't know why, he just kind of reminds me of Lord Farquhar, like something about this scene reminds me of the introduction of Lord Farquhar from Shrek. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. Whatever, let's move on from this. If I find something and it fetches a good price, how about I, uh, I buy you all dinner? Oh, please. You know as well as I do the first thing you'd buy is an airship. Oh, shut the f*** up, Pinello. Like, why are you like this? Like, just leave Vaughn alone. He's saying he would do something nice and you have to just, like, put him down. But whatever, let's just move on. We are supposed to go visit our friend Old Dallin to hear about how to sneak into the palace. But whoa! Oh my god, it's my alter ego, my secret twin brother, Mr. Balzac! <laughs> yes, you heard it right. Wow, that was so powerful. <laughs> This when I found this guy and found his name was Bullsack. That just like is incredible to me. You got Jabsack and you got Bullsack. <laughs> and I love him. He's my favorite. Yeah, we're going to do a task for old Dallin and then, oh look, it's Pinello. And what's she doing? What are you doing here? I could ask you the same, though the answer is pretty clear. No good. Oh, she's judging me again, telling me I'm up to no good. Now she's in the party, she can become our monk which is super awesome. She's going to be our strength-based character. But we collect a bunch of like sunlight into this stone because Dallin needs it for us to sneak into the palace for some reason. And then we say goodbye to Pinello. Actually, I was kind of supposed to be watching the place for Miguelo. Do you see what I mean? She's such a hypocrite. She's telling him that he's up to no good when she was up to no good herself. Like she's such a hypocrite. 
Anyway, we've made it into the palace and Van has come to steal some treasure from this lady's head, I guess. And then, whoa, hot people incoming. That's right, Balfir and Fran are also on a similar mission to steal some treasure. And I love these two characters. There's something about their design and personality that is so cool. I always use them in my party whenever I play this game. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't want Balfir to completely destroy me. You have something that belongs to me. Oh yeah, Daddy. What happened? We eventually crash their flying motorcycle and are now stuck in the sewers. But it's okay because Fran and Balfir decide to join our party to help escape. Listen, thief, Van, if you ever want to see your home again, you'll do exactly as I say. Myself, Fran, and you, we're working together now. Understood? We license Balfir as a time battle mage because we've said he is a Libra, and then we license Fran as a black mage because we've said she is a Capricorn. Even though they're both wrong, but shh, we won't talk about that. Hmm, I dare say I've soiled my cuffs. Soiled your cuffs? What, does that mean you got poop on your sleeves? <laughs> I feel like the characters in this game kind of speak in riddles, and I remember as a kid finding it very hard to keep up with the story, because nobody talks properly. It's all very cryptic, it's all very strange. Now that I'm an adult, I understand the story much more. It is also possible that I'm just dumb, like I will, <laughs> I will happily admit that. But yeah, poop on the sleeves. Balfir has poop on his sleeves, and that's cool. Good for him, I suppose. It is here that we learn how to use the Gambit system in this game, and I'm going to talk about it real quick, because I feel like this game gets quite heavily critiqued on being boring because of this battle system. Basically, in this game, your characters will perform actions automatically, and you set up conditions for these actions using this Gambit system. For example, if one of your characters is below 70% HP, then your White Mage will cast Cure on them. And you can do this for every single technique and spell and item in the game, which means the battles in this game occur quite naturally and automatically without any user input in the moment. So instead of the strategy coming in the battle, it all happens prior to battle. So if you're in a specific area with a lot of enemies that are weak to a certain spell, you know that you can gambit that spell in and they can use it automatically. And it means you can just breeze through areas watching the action happen. It feels like a bridge between the old turn-based style of gameplay that Final Fantasy was used to and the newer more action-based gameplay of the more modern Final Fantasy games. And I quite like it. It feels like a happy medium. It feels really fun. It feels fresh. It's very satisfying once you've set up a Gambit system that just works and you don't have to do anything. Unpopular opinion maybe, but that is just how I feel. Who would be next? We are then introduced to Princess Ash, but she is under the alias Amalia, and for some reason nobody recognises that she's the princess, even though you'd think you'd know the princess of your land, she'd be like a celebrity, right? But they don't question anything, they're like, yep, her name's Amalia, and she joins the party briefly, and we kill these guards, which really aren't too much trouble at all, because it's still the beginning of the game. The situation requires I accept such help as I find. You see what I mean about the language in this game? That's a very roundabout way of just saying, I need some help to get out of here, so I will come with you guys. <laughs> I guess it makes sense for Ash because she's a princess, but every character speaks like this. And it means you have to take time to really think about every single sentence they're saying, because it's never going to be plain and simple. And finally, almost 15 minutes into this episode, and we have a boss battle. Apologies for the long rants on the story and stuff, but the game takes a while to get into it. And the first battle we have here is the Jelly Monsters and I can finally talk about some strategy. So I had Van use steel automatically on the nearest visible enemy. So I quickly turn that off, otherwise he's just going to keep stealing and steal nothing. And I say this is the first boss battle. It's really, really easy. You can see their fire is dealing a lot of damage. Thanks to Fran and her black magic spells, this fight is super easy. If we didn't have her, maybe we'd have a bit of trouble, but it's the first boss of the game. It's really not going to be that hard. So uh, I do love the uh, dramatic deaths of of some of the enemies in this game like this jelly has no business doing all of that like I love that you watch the jelly monster shake and rumble and then it's all spewing its guts out and then it melts and you watch it slowly drip down the sides and it's all gooey and gross also what's cool about this game is after you defeat a boss you get this cool little end battle screen where they all like do a cool pose and you get to see your team just looking all badass and stuff and uh, 
I wish they would still do stuff like this in the newer Final Fantasy games. It's so camp and fun and silly and it just makes you feel cool and epic. Yeah, it, it, it lingers for a while. I didn't realise you could press start to end it. <laughs> I get quite lucky and find this silken shirt and then I go ahead and licence that for Fran so that she can equip it as it increases her magic power so her spells can do more damage. Then I remember to remove her automatic fire casting ready for the next boss as I know we have this battle here against the crazy cool fire phoenix with like flamey tentacles coming off of its head. Love love the design of this, very cool, very fun. This is definitely a step up in difficulty from the last boss battle but still nothing too insane. We use steel with Vaan to get that phoenix down and then I remember to remove the gambit as we have stolen the item and there is no need to do anything else. I took off the 2 times speed modifier that I use for this boss battle so that you can see what's going on. But honestly, I end up turning it back on because you can still see what's happening. I don't think it's too quick. Then this attack comes out. And it does a lot of damage and poisons us. And I'm like, whoa, this is the first time we're actually struggling a little bit in this game. What's cool about this game is you can just stop the action immediately and go into your menu and use the necessary items and spells that you need if you haven't gambited them automatically. So this game just gives you so much options, so much room, so much freedom. There's so many different spells and things you can do in this game. And it is just very epic and vast. I do really love the battle system in this game. I don't think it gets enough credit. Anyway, this attack comes out again and I'm like, oh god, here we go again. Everyone's gonna die and get poisoned. I'm preparing for the worst, but nothing really happens. I think you have to be in a certain radius to the monster for it to affect you. And luckily Fran and Balfir can chill at the back there, so they were not affected at all, which is really nice. And luckily it's regular attacks barely do anything so we don't have to worry too much. And Vaan is kind of just there healing everyone. The fact that we got a white mage in our party this early in the game is very handy. You can see here there was no real threat from dying to this enemy and it goes down after a few more hits. Hallelujah. This death is so extra. Just like all of the bosses in this game the deaths are always like fun. And it like disappears as if it's going to come back again. But I don't think you see this enemy again in the game. These people have done nothing. Release them. What are you doing? Don't interrupt me. I'm thinking. I oh, shut up when you think of God. Our party is then thrown in prison for stealing treasure from the palace, and Van gets himself in a bit of trouble with these big scary dudes, but have no fear because Balfir is here to sort them out. And sort them out we do with a very easy little fist fight. Just in time for Fran to rescue us and show us towards the exit. What was that? Okay, James. Ah, the prison repository of rested relics and raiments. So our things are in here? That's what I said. Okay, so we're still trying to escape the prison and we get this lovely ass shot here of everybody as they find the exit, only to be greeted with Bosch who has been locked in prison and Vaan has had enough. He knows that this is the guy that killed Rex and he is mad as hell. Which, you know, is very Aries of him, short tempered, you know, that was part of his traits. And of course he is blowing their cover because he can't help himself, he's getting too emotional and Fran decides to drop Bosch's prison cell as they fall all the way down this giant hole and somehow Bosch survives this. <laughs> well somehow they all survive this but Bosch especially is like chained up and is like looking like he's near death, falls on some rocks and is just like fine. <laughs> Spare us your quiddities. I'm just going to quickly Google what that means. I've never heard this word before. Um, the inherent nature or essence of someone or something. So he's basically saying, stop being yourself for a minute, Vaughn. Finally, we have reached a shop that has a bunch of weapons and armor that fit the classes that we have assigned them. And we go ahead and buy every single spell under the book since we are using all the mages in this run. And then you've got this area here, which has these like electric bug monsters that can zap electricity away. It's really not a very hard area and everybody feels pretty powerful now that they have weapons and armor that suit them. And it is here that we find out that it wasn't Bosch who killed Varn's brother. It was his twin brother. <gasps> a twin brother? Fancy that. That's convenient. The evil brother motif is a bit of a cliche, but hey, Bosch and his twin brother have a pretty cool relationship and story throughout the game, so I'm not too mad about it. 
Oh yeah, boss battle time. And now we've got the giant queen electric spider thing. And it's got all of its little tiny minions. And this boss battle is quite hard just due to the sheer amount of enemies that are on screen. And you can see here I've forgotten to remove Varn's steel gambit. And I do remember in a sec. And we have actually been shopping and bought the foe's HP 100% use steel. Uh, Gambit, that's a, a bit of a mouthful, I'll admit. So basically, at the start of every fight, Varn will use steel, and as soon as someone deals damage to the enemy, he won't use steel anymore. This just assures that he uses steel at the beginning of the battle, and then as soon as he's stolen the item, he won't use it again. Yeah, I've given it to Varn mainly because his damage output is pretty weak. As he is mainly healing people, it means when he has no healing to do, instead of just dealing really small amounts of damage, he can at least be getting some items. And yeah, this boss battle is not too hard. You saw its big attack come out and nothing really happened. And our party is really strong apparently because it goes down very easily. This is still the beginning of the game and I promise you once we get into some of the hunts this game becomes much more difficult because uh, I like to try and defeat them way before they're supposed to be defeated. You'll see how much trouble we go through later on. Once we escape the dungeon, we're back in this area which we started in when we killed the tomato all that time ago with just Vaughn. And there's something very satisfying about this. The pacing of this part of the game is really nice. These wolves that previously took a few hits to defeat with Vaughn are now just being one-shotted by our party. So it's a good indicator on how strong we have become. And I love when games do stuff like this. You'll also notice I use Fran as the leader most of the time in this part of the game. And it's because in this game, as you walk around, you recover MP and it just makes sense to have our black mage be the leader because the leader does the most walking we want Fran's MP to recover so she can keep using fire so it just makes sense for her to be in the lead of our party I get a little bit cocky here because I was feeling strong after killing all these wolves and I'm like ah oh, there's this giant dinosaur that you can't kill at the beginning of the game maybe I'm more powerful now and can defeat it and uh I, I got humbled real quick, but we didn't die. I managed to run away with Belfir just in time, but um, that was definitely a close call. And then, believe it or not, Bullzak here is actually a part of the story, and we have to go to him to give him some sword or something so that we can find Bosch again. And now Bosch is back in his regular clothes, and he is ready to join our party. And I find his outfit quite strange. I'm not quite sure what all of these belts at the top of his shirt are doing. Why are they not buckled up? And what would even be the point in buckling them up? Like, I just don't understand the belts. Like, <laughs> the outfits in this game are quite tame compared to other Final Fantasy games. But Bosch's outfit always does confuse me. But hey, we finally have our red mage in the party. And Bosch ends up being one of my favorite characters in this game. The red mage is actually incredible. He comes in so handy, especially in the mid game. And um, he has a very powerful spell called Dark which hits all enemies, and you'll see when we go on to the hunts how incredibly useful this magic skill is. Just get me there and I'll find Pinello myself. So Pinello has been kidnapped by a group of bandits that are after Balfir, so the band has decided to rejoin together as they all have a common goal at the moment. But before we continue with some story stuff, the hunts are now ready and open. So let's go and do some of those real quick. And this is where the fun of this challenge begins because I love the hunts in this game. They add a really unique challenge. Most of the story bosses are fairly simple, but the hunts add a very unique twist to the game that make it much more challenging and fun. We do also purchase these cool gambits such as Fire Week, Lightning Week and Ice Week. So this means that Fran will use the correct spell depending on what the enemy is weak to, which means we don't have to constantly use up all of our spells for every enemy, but only use them when necessary. And our first hunt here is against this giant wolf who goes down very easily thanks to Dark, but hey, it's like the first ever hunt, so what can you expect? And uh, the second one is a little bit more challenging, mostly because it's undead, which makes it much harder, but Cure actually deals damage to it, so Varn can actually pump out some cool damage in this fight, and we manage to take it down without too much of an issue. And then the third hunt is against this cactus monster, and I'm not even going to show you any of the footage for that because it was very easy. It went down without very much fight at all. But what wasn't easy was this fourth battle here against these giant chickens. And considering how the last ones went, I thought this is going to be super easy, right? And these guys just have a lot of HP 
And the only way we can really do damage now is with Bosch's Dark Attack, as it hits all of the chickens at once and does massive damage. The issue, however, is that Dark uses up a lot of MP that we do not have, and uh, our defenses are terrible, because at the moment we have a party of four mages, it just means that our HP gets depleted very easily. And not only is it four mages, it's four mages with really low magic stats. The two best mages in the game are Ash and Pinello, and we do not have access to them at the moment, and they are also not mages in this run, because their star signs do not allow them to be mages. As you can see, Bosch has already run out of MP, and he is our main damage dealer, which is quite sad, and uh, Fran and Van are not too far behind them. As they continue to use fire and cure, their MP is going to deplete, and then they are left sitting like little ducks, not being able to do anything, because uh, as you would guess, the black mage and the white mage have really bad attacks, so physical damage is not the way to go for this fight. We need to have MP, and we need to be dealing magic damage. Balfir actually is quite strong. He has a fairly high strength stat, compared to the other characters anyway. So once we send him in, we start doing a little bit more damage, but we've only killed one chicken thus far. And we keep targeting different chickens for some reason. Every time we uh, get one near the end, they switch targets and then start attacking another chicken. It's probably something to do with my gambits. I'm pretty sure I changed that later on. Yeah, as it's going right now, it's not looking too good. I'm making sure to do everything I possibly can. But as you can see, everyone is dead or at least dying. I've used a lot of Phoenix Downs. I tried to run away with Balfir because I was like, right, this is not going well. I'm clearly going to lose here. And I get sniped just before I exit the screen. Meaning this is our first death. Straight back in with attempt number two, and this time I was like, right, now is the time to use strategy. I was saying earlier how I never use the techniques that time battle mages have because it's hard to gambit them, and it turns out immobilize is a really useful technique, and I'm so glad that I had the brain power to think to use their spells. Who would have thought the spells in this game were actually usable, and that you're supposed to use them on enemies to defeat battles? Uh, usually when I play this game, I just use the quickenings to defeat all the enemies because it's so overpowered and it just means every boss fight is just like a breeze, but it's really not fun and I've had so much fun playing this game this way round instead and having to actually use my brain to think of things to make the fights easier and I've loved it honestly. You can see I keep running around with all of these characters uh, whenever they're not performing actions. That's just so that their MP can recover just a little bit and uh, I noticed too late that Balfir is petrified. So I'm like, okay, quickly throw a remedy at him or something, uh, but I was too late and he got turned to stone. So Balfir is just out in this uh, fight. And I feel like this one could have been a win, but I just played it a little bit too sloppily and uh, it's not over yet. We do still have Bosch, Fran and Van, our three black, white and red mages. And as long as we are dealing dark damage, we could be okay. So uh, we just need to make sure Bosch is alive. I'm controlling Van and running around with him because I feel like health is very, very important. So we need to make sure he always has enough MP to be casting Cure. But he is casting Cure like nobody's business because these enemies are just dealing way too much damage. And again, I try to run away, but they're too quick for me and I get sniped by the giant chicken again, meaning this is our second death. Attempt number three, and this time I'm going to use up some of my license points. So I give Bush and Van the Martyr ability, which allows them to recover MP when they take damage, as well as increasing Van's HP. And then moving on to Balfir, I increase his HP, as well as give him more attack power, just so that we can do some more damage. And uh, you can see there with that first hit, he's doing a good amount of damage. 170 is not bad at all. It's still not as good as Dark, obviously, but it's good enough. And um, this time I'm like, right, we need to get everybody immobilized. Basically, what Immobilize does is it stops them from moving. They can still perform actions, but they can't move towards you. And all of our characters can hit from far away. Balfir has a crossbow, and Fran, Van, and Bosch use black and white magic, which can be casted at a distance. So, as long as they're all immobilized, we can just stay back and watch the battle happen. So that was the strategy I was going with, but Immobilize doesn't have a very good chance of being inflicted on these guys. I think it's because Balfir's magic stat is so low that it just keeps on failing, but we do get quite lucky in this. 
but uh, it doesn't last too long. We got it on the big chicken first, and then after a few minutes, he was out. Not even a few minutes, it was like a few seconds, honestly. But as long as the little chickens are down, I feel a lot better. So I'm just focusing on those first before I take on the big boy chicken, because that means once we have just one chicken left, we can just focus all of our damage on it and we don't have to worry too much. It can inflict petrify on us though, which is a problem because remedies don't cure petrification, at least not yet. You actually have to license um, a special license thingy that allows petrify to be cured by remedies and we don't have that at the moment. So if any character gets petrified, they will turn to stone and they will just be out of the party. We do get quite unlucky that it hits Vaan, because Vaan is the only one who can heal us. So as soon as Vaan is out of the game, we're going to have to rely on potions. And uh, the timer seems to be ticking quite quickly, and eventually he dies. Um, so that means it is up to Balfir, Fran and Bosch to get the job done. But I'm feeling good. Bosch is slowed, however, which is annoying, and we have no way to cure slow off of us. We can't cast haste yet either, that comes way later in the game. Also, Bosch's MP has run out so he can't use dark. Luckily, we haven't been using Fran, so she's just coming in with fire. And fire doesn't do too much, but it does a lot more than our physical damage does. And with Balfir and Fran, I I'm feeling like we can get enough damage to get this done. I tried casting slow on this guy as well, turns out he's immune, and that's just good to know, I suppose. But yeah, this time I get Immobilize out again, very luckily. We got very lucky with Immobilize in this, it, it could have failed several times and it didn't. And um, this final Immobilize here is incredible because this duck, this duck, nope. this chicken is just sat here chilling and we can just keep wailing and wailing on him. You can see though his health bar takes a long time to go down, he's got a lot of health and it goes down very slowly. And it feels like as his HP gets lower, he also raises his defenses. But eventually, after a few more attacks, it finally goes down. Whew, that was intense, but really, really fun. I had a great time with that battle. That was uh, the kind of challenge that I needed. Finally, it is time to move on to the sky city of Brugerba. And immediately we are met with Lamont, who is actually Larsa, because everybody in this game uses an alias, and Vaan being Vaan does this. I don't know what's in that mind, Lamont, but you're in good hands. Right, Bosch? You're a dead man. Don't forget it. And no names, of course. You're stupid. We do a quick bit of shopping to increase everybody's stats and Bosch now has Protect which is awesome, he can use that automatically when somebody's health gets below 70% which is really really nice little handy bit of tech. And here in the Lusu Mines we have these undead enemies and I didn't realise that they are actually healed up by Dark so Bosch is just going to be useless for this part. His attack damage is pretty low and Dark is the only real thing that he can do that does a lot of damage. So instead of changing up his gambits, we're just going to remove him and use a party of Van, Balfir and Fran. Plus Lamont as well is there doing some other little stuff and he's actually a pretty good party member because he can cast potions on us and that means Van can use his cure spell on the undead enemies and deal damage to them instead. So yeah, this is actually like one of the best grind spots in the game because of all these skeletons just appearing. It means you can get a huge chain and get some really cool items from them, as well as some nice experience and license points. I don't hang about here too long, so I don't want to be too overpowered, but we do a little bit of grinding. What do you know about the Draglaw Laboratories? Tell me, who are you? Not everything is going too well though, as Balfir has caught on that Lamont is not who he says he is, but before they have time to question him too much, we are ambushed by Begamnum and his goons, and you can run away from this fight, and I thought, hang on, let's try and see if we can beat them, and immediately I see how much damage they're doing, and I'm like, nope, run away, run away now. It would not seem they follow. We've lost them. I guess Pinello managed to escape somehow, and Larsa ends up being the brother of Vayne Solidar, and is henceforth the Prince of Arcadia, which is a bit of a gag. I'm gaggedy goop to the goopery goop, goop, goopity goop, goop, goop. And for some reason, he decides to take Pinello with him. I don't really know why he couldn't have just like left her there. But um, we now move on to the best part of the game. Here we go. Time to meme it up. Oh yeah. I'm Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg of Dalmaska. I'm Captain Bosch. Bosch lives. I'm Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg of Dalmaska. I'm Captain Bosch von Ronsenberg of Dalmaska. Bosch lives. Bosch lives. Bosch lives. 
I'm the bot for Watson. Stop it! I feel like I've been pretty harsh on Penelo and her character, but I don't think she is all terrible. I actually really like this scene with her and Larsa, and I really like their relationship with each other. I feel like she kind of humbles him and forces him to change his perspective a bit. I feel like Larsa has probably led a very privileged life and isn't exactly aware of what the people of Damascus go through living underneath the Empire. He assumes they are all happy and love the Empire when the reality of it is that they are scared and frightened and confused and Pinello kind of invites him into this way of thinking which is uh, really cool. And yeah, the sound design usually in this game is pretty bad, but they do a really nice cool thing here. After Pinello says, he frightens me, the music pauses, and it's just like quite a nice dramatic effect, because it's so real. He frightens me. Why? I know that sounds silly and kind of minuscule, but it's little details like this that I really look for as like a filmmaker myself. I really appreciate these little attention to details that just make the story feel a bit more cohesive and dynamic. So you fear the Empire? Yes. Now we've got another hard boss battle against Mr. Snakey Guy, and this is like our what, fifth or sixth hunt? I can't remember at this point, but the hunts are coming in strong and we are going for it. This guy is definitely very strong, I'm probably not at the level I should be to fight this guy, but like I said, I like a challenge, so I'm gonna go for it. And uh, I'm just switching off some of the gambits that I feel like we don't need. This guy is not casting any magical spells on us, so I remove the automatic casting of Shell when we get below 70% HP. And this little skeleton dude to the left of us is a bit of a problem because it means we can't use dark without healing it and we want to use dark on the snake because it does the most damage but it's going to keep healing up this skeleton which means our party is going to keep taking more damage and it's a bit annoying that uh we are you know having to deal with this stupid skeleton when we just want to fight the boss we don't want anything to do with the skeleton but he is there unfortunately and then i kind of run in the wrong direction and another enemy starts attacking us and i'm like okay I think it's time to just sort of run away from these enemies and try get the snake on its own. But that doesn't seem to be happening and people keep dying so I'm like right let's just leave and try this again. But of course as soon as I leave the screen there are like three enemies just sat here waiting to kill me so I'm like oh god I literally can't escape and Fran is getting down to very low HP and I'm starting to panic and I just think Maybe I just need to let myself die and try this one again. Also, whenever you leave the screen, the uh, boss goes back up to full health. So, um, yeah, we do still have Balfir, but he's not going to be able to take it by himself. And I need to plan more for this fight. So I let him kill me and give ourselves a game over, ready to retry again. This time, we do not have a skeleton near us, only a bat. So that is fine. Dark can kill the bats fine. They are not healed up by Dark, which is lovely. And now we seem to just have the snake by himself, we can actually start to do this fight. The snake does have protect on him, but that's fine because we're mainly using magic damage anyway from Fran and Bosch. But it does of course weaken some of Balfir's attacks, but he's still doing a pretty decent amount of damage anyway. And now that he is by himself, he is not as much of a threat to us as he was before. We also have rays from Varn, so we don't have to keep using Phoenix Downs. And I figured this would be the best party to use just because it feels the most diverse and also Bosch has the downside of accidentally casting his magic attacks on the skeletons. But of course once they die, instead of reviving them I'm like let's just bring out Bosch because he still has some fight in him. And for some reason when he gets down to low HP we struggle a lot but eventually it does go down and we kill the fire with only one death which is uh, lovely. The next hunt can be found also in the Lusu Mine, so I'm like, hey, let's go for that one. And this guy is far from lovely. He has a lot of health, a lot of defense, a lot of strength, and is also surrounded by skeletons. So um, I very quickly realized that we are far too underpowered for this. Like, the, as soon as the fight begins, people are just dead, and I'm like, wow. This guy is definitely a much later part of the game. I could try and use some cool techniques like immobilize and things like that. 
but I don't think that's going to help us. This is definitely out of our league right now. Of course, that doesn't stop me from trying as much as I can. I'm reviving people. I'm doing all the things I feel like I can. I'm running around. The only issue with running around is that it summons more skeletons. So uh, you kind of have to be stationary for this one, which doesn't help because we need to recover our MP. And we also need to dodge some attacks and revive people. But um, yeah, this was another obvious game over right here. I do actually give it one more attempt just to see if there was something I missed, like a little strategy. I managed to get slow on it this time, but that doesn't help at all. And we die again. Why indeed? You should find the enemy's chains an easy burden to bear. I'm going to come back to this guy later once we are more powerful, but for now let's continue with the story. And Bosch decides to pull out his sword on this very important person, which means we get arrested again for the 500 millionth time. And here is some more Star Wars references. This one was another one that was very immediately obvious. Like, I can see the scene in my head right now when they're arrested. I imagine future me is going to be putting a little side by side of the two clips and blurring them together so that you can see how uh, referential this part of the game is and um, hey I said I wasn't gonna bring it up too much only where I feel it is necessary and this one just like caught my eye immediately where I was like ah I know this scene this is Star Wars I see it I believe it I feel it in my bones it is there and I ain't knocking it I'm not mad about it I'm just pointing it out that's all we're gonna not point it out as much anymore okay that's the last time let's continue <coughs> after what you've done how dare you you're supposed to be dead it is here that we find out that Amalia, who was with us earlier, is none other than Princess Ash of Dalmasca. But she has no proof of her identity. I guess she left her driver's license in her other purse and cannot prove she is the princess. So they arrest her and the rest of our party, but we escape and it is time to rescue her. Fear not their numbers. Take down the leaders and the others will follow. We have this battle here, which I guess is a boss battle, but it's really not hard, thanks to my main boy Bosch using Dark and we also gave Disable to Balfir whenever there are five plus enemies on screen which just means everyone gets disabled which is really really cool. It's really hard to junction these time battle mage magic abilities but I quite like the there are too many enemies on screen let's immobilize them sort of strategy. It means he doesn't cast it too often and whenever it is inflicted on people we can just remove it afterwards and this fight is now a cakewalk since they cannot do anything and uh, yeah this last guy takes a little bit longer than the rest but nothing challenging at all we barely even had to use cure because our party is so badass and um, now we can go into this cell here and rescue the princess oh that, that that pose looks familiar nope I'm not gonna say it I'm not gonna do it we are not going there anymore Ash is now a part of our party thanks to our rescue mission and we go ahead and license her the Ulan class so finally we have a physical damage dealing character and she's got loads of license points to use up so we go ahead and increase her HP exponentially I have the mind of a master master I have the mind of a mastermind what's that I don't know so we actually have a tank in the class somebody who can take damage and absorb all of the incoming damage that comes to us and then soon after that Penelo is here to and she joins our party and we've already assigned her the monk class that means we have a full party and uh, we're getting towards the end of this video here so please do not forget to like comment and subscribe these videos take a very long time to make they are time consuming but of course hella fun if you want to leave a tip feel free to leave a tip on youtube and i will shout out your comment at the end of the next video if you do so yeah we go ahead and spend a lot of Penelo's license points she also gets a lot of hp nodes as well as a lot of battle lore which increases her physical strength meaning we have some solid physical damage dealers on our team now and we can start to have a more balanced party rather than one that is all magic based and dies extremely easily and that leads us to the final boss of this part yes that is right we are now going to fight judge so and so what's his name judge geese is this judge geese i can't remember but we're against this judge here and I really wanted to change my party up. I wanted to have Bosch in so that he could be dealing dark damage to all of the enemies in this radius. But in this game, if you are being attacked and your name is in red at the bottom, it means you can't switch out because there is an action being performed on you. 
And because of the amount of enemies that are here, it means that there are always actions going to be cast on all of our characters because there are so many of them and none of them have a break to allow us to do anything. So we are stuck with this party of Van, Balfir and Ash. It's not the worst thing in the world. Two physical dealers and a white mage means that we are probably going to not struggle very much at all. Luckily we had Van in the party, but if another party member died, we could have just switched him in anyway. Oh, we, we actually got a little frame there where uh, we could switch someone out. But it was Vaughn, and we don't want to switch Vaughn out. And uh, judging by this guy's health bar, we don't actually need to switch anyone out. I thought this fight would be a lot harder than it was. But I think spending all of those license points on Ash's HP and uh, strength means that we are not going to struggle in this battle at all. And how many times am I going to say struggle? I'm clearly running out of things to say. Clearly the struggle is real. He goes down eventually, his helmet comes off to reveal that he is an ugly old man, and uh, that is the end of part one, guys. Yeah, I've had a really, really good time, and I hope you guys have had a good time, but uh, tune in next week when the run continues and things get a lot more tricky as the game stops holding our hands and decides to throw us into the deep end with some really difficult fights and some other cool story stuff. So, once again, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. My name has been Jamsack, see you guys next time.